This is Folk Scene. I'm Howard Larman. Our guest is Stan Rogers. Oh, how do you do, Howard? <laughs> Good to have you here again, Stan. Yeah, it's a treat to be back. Can I start with a song? Sure, sure. Um, why don't I just do the song and we'll talk about it later. Okay. Now it's just my luck to have the watch with nothing left to do. Watch the deadly waters glide as we roll north to the Sioux And wonder when they'll turn again and pitch us to the rail And whirl off one more youngster in the game The kid was so damn eager, it was all so big and new He never had to tell him twice or find him work to do and evenings on the mess deck He was always first to sing And show us pictures of the girl he'd wed in spring But I told that kid a hundred times Don't take these lakes for granted They go from calm to a hundred knots So fast they seem enchanted But tonight some red-eyed wired and girl lies staring at the wall And her lover's gone into a white squall Now it's a thing that us old timers know In a sultry summer calm There comes a blow from nowhere And it goes off like a bomb And a 15,000 tonner Can be thrown upon her beam While the gale takes all before it with a scream The kid was on the hatches Lying staring at the sky From where I stood I swear I could see tears fall from his eyes So I hadn't the heart to call him And say you should be on a line Even on a night so warm and fine I told that kid a hundred times Don't take the lakes for granted they go from calm to a hundred knots, so fast they seem enchanted. But tonight some red-eyed wired and girl lies staring at the wall, and her lover's gone into a white squall. When it struck, he sat up with a start, I roared to him, get down But for all that he could hear, I could as well not made a sound So I clung there to the stanchions, and I felt my face go pale As he crawled hand over hand along the rail Now I could feel her healing over, with the fury of the blow I watched the rail go under then so terrible and slow Then like some great dog she shook herself and roared upright again Far over her side I heard him call my name I told that kid a hundred times don't take the lakes for granted they go from calm to a hundred knots So fast they seem enchanted But tonight some red-eyed wired and girl Lies staring at the wall And her lover's gone into a white squall So it's just my luck to have the watch with nothing left to do Watch the deadly waters glide as we roll north to the Sioux And wonder when they'll turn again And pitch us to the rail And whirl off one more youngster in the gale 
I tell these kids a hundred times, don't take the lakes for granted. They go from calm to a hundred, not so fast they seem enchanted. But tonight some red-eyed, wired and girl lies staring at the wall. And her lover's gone into a white squall. Now, as you explained the other night, the white squall is a real phenomenon. You want to tell us about it? Well, it's a, a meteorological phenomenon on the Great Lakes. Um, what happens is that it's a very local disturbance, a very local storm, and uh, it strikes very much without warning. Uh, a squall is, a, of course, a sudden, severe storm. And uh, it's usually accompanied by high winds and very little rain. By high winds, I mean uh, winds approaching 100 knots. And uh, it goes from you know, dead calm to 100 knots in the space of a minute or so, and it'll last anything up to half an hour, and then it goes away again just as quickly, but it could be as short as five minutes. The, the real danger of a white squall, of course, if you have a, a sailing ship or a, even a motor vessel with a high superstructure, if the wind catches you on, on the beam, then uh, the chances are very real that you'll capsize. And an awful lot of ships have been lost in white squalls. And I, I, think, it's, I think the white squall is unique to the Great Lakes. Uh, I don't think it happens in quite that fashion anywhere else in the world. The other thing in, that's, in that song that um, might not be... Uh, readily accessible to the, the first listener. Wyerton, Ontario is a little town on Georgian Bay on Lake Huron about, uh, oh, call it 200 miles uh, northeast of Detroit. And uh, Wyerton, for some strange reason, has provided more senior officers for Great Lakes shipping boats than any other town in North America. Anyway, that's, that's the white squall. Well, Stan, I really want to uh, congratulate you on Northwest Passage. Beautiful album. Oh, thank you. You did a really superb job on it. And I had some really superb help. Uh, my producer, of course, Paul Mills, is uh, uh, he may be just the best folk music producer in, in North America. I certainly haven't found anybody else that I would trust nearly as much. Uh, and we had just a dynamite gang of musicians in my own band, of course, plus uh, some really neat people from uh, the great Speckled Bird, for example, Sylvia Tyson's band. Mm -hmm. um, we brought in uh, just an outrageously hot... Uh, country electric guitarist called Pepe Francis and uh, you know Claude Desjardins on drums Froggy Baby we call him uh, <laughs> Danny Greenspoon on an electric guitar my brother played electric guitar violin and viola uh, we had the keyboard and f and b violin player from uh, Bard you may have heard of yes. them a sort of uh, French Canadian traditional fusion group um, and you know so we had Chris Crilly there for keyboards and, and fiddle um uh, who else did we have that was really interesting? I guess just my own guys, and of course Curly Boy Stubbs, who is Paul Mills' alter ego. I thought he had dropped that. I'd read somewhere that. Well, yeah, we're going to kill off Curly Boy. Um, I see. Paul, uh, being a CBC producer, the CBC for those listeners here who don't know what that is, that's sort of the, the national radio and television network. It's like PBS without the class, you know. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, Paul works for the CBC as a producer, and time after time he'd find himself playing in, in the CBC studios, and of course he couldn't do that under his own name, that's Moonlighting, or Conflict of Interest or something. So he invented this persona, Curly Boy Stubbs with two Bs, and <laughs> invented a whole uh, past history for him and everything. And he performed as Curly Boy, sorry, I'm just reaching for my coffee here. Uh, he performed as Curly Boy for uh, like four or five years on festival stages and in the studio and stuff. And then I guess last year he got tired of him, so we're going to kill him off. His obituary will appear in uh, Come For To Sing magazine uh, probably sometime next year. Uh -huh. I've written, I've already written the obituary. It's, uh, <laughs> he has a very chess. Is he going to die a rather um, traditional kind of... No, he dies, he dies from the effects of trying to stick his entire head inside a bottle of scotch. <laughs> <laughs> that may be traditional to some people. <laughs> uh, term, terminal protru protrusion of the tongue, I think it was called. Uh, uh, for those people that join us late, our guest is Stan Rogers. How about another song? Sure, gladly. I have to do a bit of retuning here. I mean, well, maybe I won't. Maybe There's a, a sort of whimsical song that I wrote years ago that uh, also incorporates this open G tuning. and might save a bit of time. Years and years ago, Howard, I was... More years than I care to think about, really. 
I, uh, I was going out with a, a fashion designer. And she was a, a lovely girl and an extremely intelligent and witty woman. She only had one failing. Um, when I came to see her after being on a long tour or something, I wouldn't have seen her for some months, and I'd be wanting to be all romantic. I'd turn up there with a bottle of wine and, you know, and a present for her and stuff like this, and look, be looking forward to a nice romantic evening by the fireplace in her apartment. And uh, I'd been, I would have been thinking about this for days. Well, of course, while I'd been gone, she would designed a whole new wardrobe of clothes and uh, would have all these things saved up. And the first thing that would happen when I got in the door would be there'd be a fashion show for four or five hours, right? And meanwhile, I'm sitting there, you know, the wine's going stale, and I'm smoking more and more cigarettes, and... Well, anyway. <laughs> this is called Lady Dress Up. Now everyone knows how the color of clothes hides whatever could show of whatever you're thinking inside of your skin but it's different with you cause whatever you wear all you are is still there for those who can see Fashions and fads fill the Saturday ads And I should be glad That your powerful potions and softening lotions Just cover your skin Hiding nothing inside Though I know that you tried Before you knew me your buttons and braces and ribbons and laces are not what you are And no matter how sweet shoes get, just keep feet from the cold Zippers get stuck and you always need luck with the hook at your neck And you always forget your stockings will only get whole Just show what you already know From your head to your toe You're a colorful picture But what does it prove? Cause whenever you're here All these clothes that you wear Only seem to be there For me to remove So stay for a while And I'll try to ignore The clothes that you wear There on the floor Stan, I have a hunch that there's a whole bunch of songs that that uh, you don't get to perform much anymore that they're Oh yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> it's like I, I tried to explain to the audience the other night uh, at, Mc, at McCabe's. I uh, after you do a song three or four thousand times on stage, you know, you write the tune and you're real happy with it, so you drag it out on stage. Do it three or four thousand times, it becomes a little difficult to make it new anymore. And there's a whole bunch of songs that I've written that, while they're still very good songs, uh, I guess. I mean, people still call for them. Uh, I just can't get them going anymore and uh, so I don't do them except on very rare occasions this that last song is one of them I don't think I've performed that on stage since the middle 70s somewhere hmm. do you ever take account of how many songs you've written nah. you idea? nah I'm not a very prolific writer really um, if I if I write 20 tunes in a, in a year that's a good year for me last time you were here you said something about taking time off and doing nothing but writing I tried it. <laughs> what happened? Well, 
the Canada Council for the Arts, it's a government organization that um, provides living expenses for artists so that they don't have to go out and work. They can concentrate on their art. Yeah. And I'd always kind of taken a dim view of the outfit because uh, I figure government-sponsored art is mediocre art in the most case. You know, if you can't, if you're not good enough to make a living, then you shouldn't be doing it. You know, that kind of stuff. But um, some friends of mine gave me a severe talking to and told me that my attitude and approach was chauvinistic and dumb and that I should avail myself of this cash money lying around. So I thought, well, okay, fine. I applied to the Canada Council for a grant. I wanted to write a bunch of songs about the Great Lakes. And they said, gee, Stan, it sounds like a great idea. And they gave me the money, and I was going to take uh, the three summer months off, June, July, and August. So I, I stopped booking anything for those three months, and I rented an office near my house and uh, moved a typewriter and a desk and a tape machine in and microphones and stuff and I had it all set up for the ideal working songwriter's paradise. And then all of a sudden, the phone just started ringing right off the wall. People uh, calling me up with uh, gigs, the price of which I couldn't refuse, you know. Uh -huh. it was, I couldn't turn down that kind of money. Consequently, um, out of the 92 days that I had available to actually do some writing, I actually spent 21 days in the office. <laughs> the rest of the time I was on the road, I couldn't resist. Did you get any of the songs written? Or? I've got about three quarters of the next album written uh, from the summer, and uh, I know what the rest of the tunes are going to be like. It's just a question of uh, getting down and writing them and getting back in the office. I hope to get some time when I get home and do that, finish the album, and then take the songs on the road for a couple of months. We're going to go, in the, go back in the studio in February for a new album. It's hard to believe that you write songs as easily or mechanically as you say you do. I mean, they have such feeling and emotion, and, but you describe it in rather kind of sitting down and writing a song. Well, there's a discipline involved, Howard. Um, I mean, songwriting is an acquired art. You know, you, can't, you don't just sit down and write a good song. I mean, maybe somebody can do that, but I sure as hell can. Um, I had to teach myself my craft, and I take it extremely seriously. And I don't write lightweight material, really. Um, yeah. You know, most of my lyrics are pretty me meaty. They, they're they all, almost always in, sure. in kind of a narrative style. There's always a story. Um, and in order to achieve these kind of things, you have to, you have to sit down and sort of discipline yourself. Um, if you get inspired to write a song, that's just great. But you can't always rely on inspiration. What, you got, what I've got to do sometimes is sit down in my office with a stack of books and do some research and uh, do some daydreaming and, and uh, noodling around with the guitar mm -hmm. piano and piano, um, though I don't play much piano. Uh, but, you know, I noodle around until the idea gels. And then once I start writing the song, I start bringing in a whole bag of tricks that I've developed over the years. You know, uh, all sorts of, you know, just common literary devices like onomatopoeia, uh, mm -hmm. similes and metaphors and, uh, you know, juggled syntax, alliteration, uh, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Anything to punch up the lyrics and, and uh, perhaps bring some more poetic value into them. And with this with this bag of tricks, once I once I finished uh, once I have finished the song, it tells the story. The lyrics hang together. They scan um, all the sort of things that you uh, understood poetry to be when you right. took it in grade eight. You know. <laughs> For those people that join us later, I guess it's Stan Rogers. Uh, how about another song? Sure, anytime. I got to do a little retuning here. Okay. While you're doing that, let me tell the listeners that there are four albums of Stan Rogers on Fogarty's Cove Music, which is his own label. We'll talk about that a little later, too. Yeah, it might be fun to talk about the the joys of owning a record label <laughs> company. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> if there uh, are any. <laughs> there are three studio albums, one live album. Yeah, there, it'll be a while before there's another live album, too. That was the most harrowing experience. I know there's all these turkeys around the country like me that go around telling people <coughs> how wonderful it is to do live albums and without having ever been having to be involved. Oh, I was involved in one live album that I produced, but some of us uh, don't realize the uh, what's involved. So uh, what happens is we go around encouraging people to make live albums and then they come back and cuss us, you know. Well, I can see why. <laughs> I, uh, I remember very vividly doing the live album and being up there on stage. And we had a full house in front of us, a big audience. And uh, 
and we my, my primary obligation of course was to entertain them right you know i mean they'd paid you know uh, ten dollars to get in and stuff and they were sitting there and they wanted to be entertained but what i was really conscious of was the fact that just on the other side of the rear stage wall from me was a uh, a mobile recording rig mm -hmm. that was costing me 110 or 120 bucks an hour mm -hmm. And those that six, sixteen track machine was rolling, and uh, time was a wasting, and I'd better get an album out of it. And uh, I mean, it would be different if it was a record company paying for it. I'd toss up my hands and say, "Oh well, they can write it off." But when you're digging in your own wallet for uh, you know for sixteen thousand dollars worth of production time, then uh, it you know it, you start to be conscious of the fact that you got four nights to get this album out, four nights of playing in this place, and you've got to get an album out of it, and it better be good. As it turned out, we were real lucky because uh, by the Friday night, we had what we, we figured we had an album in the can, and Saturday night was just insurance. Consequently, we all relaxed. We went out there, played our asses off, and nine or eight of the nine cuts on the album are from the, the Saturday night show. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> but it's it's a blood curdling experience. I don't want to do that for a long time. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't mind doing it if I if I could just walk out on stage and do a show and. Uh, if they got it, if the, if they got a recording of it, fine. If not, it's not my money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this song uh, is also a new one from the Great Lakes series. It's called "Last Watch," and it deals with the passage of the the last steam excursion boat on the Great Lakes. Uh, it was a, a ship called the Midland that operated around Georgian Bay and you know, took tourists out for day trips in the islands and stuff. Very interesting and very pretty old boat. It was scrapped in a Lake Erie boneyard. It was cut up for scrap. And uh, I always thought that was kind of sad. And I, and I decided to use the Midland as an allegory for people who are forced to retire before their time. So this is Last Watch. They dragged her down dead from Tobermory Too cheap to spare her one last head of steam Deep in diesel fume embrace Dust and soot upon the face of one who was so clean They brought me here to watch her in the bone Yard. Just two old wrecks to spend the night alone It's dark inside this evil place Clouds on the moon hide her disgrace This whiskey hides my own It's the last watch on the Midland the last watch alone One last night to love her The last night she's home My guess is that we were young together Like hers, my strength was young and hard as steel Like her too, I knew my ground Scarcely felt the years go round And answered to the wheel But then they quenched the fire Beneath the boiler Gave me a watch and showed me out the door In 64 you're still the best One year more and then you're less than dust upon the floor It's the last watch on the Midland The last watch on Last night. 
night she's home So here's to useless superannuation And us old relics of the days of steam In the morning, Lord, I would prefer When men and torches come for her Let angels come for me It's the last watch on the Midland The last watch alone One last night to love her The last night she is whole It's the last watch on the Midland The last watch alone One last night to love her For those people that join us late, our guest is Stan Rogers. Stan, uh, I wanted to talk some more about Canadian history and writing story songs and sure. things like that. But before I do, because I don't want people, I want people to sort of experience the full range of Stan Rogers. And I wondered if you'd do me a favor and do a song of the candle. Oh my, <laughs> all right. That would sort of go with that discussion we were having before about writing. You know. I still do Song of the Candle quite often. <laughs> Excuse me. I was up late last night with some musical friends here in town singing my head off, so I'm, I got a toad in my throat. It feels like an alligator at the moment, actually. Song of the Candle is one of those things I, c I can't really do in the middle of a show anymore. For one thing, it's a, it's a pretty depressing piece. I think everybody can relate to that song. Uh, even non-artistic people like myself. If, if I'm going to uh, even write a letter to somebody, <laughs> I can relate to like not being able to sort of get it up get it together it just it just didn't want to come together the way it... creative constipation is a real problem you know <laughs> it's a, you, you get the you, the feeling that you really want to create something you yeah. you're feeling in the mood to be artistic you know and you sit there and stare at that blank piece of paper and nothing comes it's just you're just wasting your time you drink cup after cup of coffee figuring it'll get, get you a buzz on. And then, of course, the big mistake that a lot of people make is that they figure, well, maybe if I do some mind-altering drugs or something like that, it'll get, give me an inspiration from the cosmos. And all that does is make you stupid. As I found out to my sorrow years ago, Anyway, Song of the Candle came about uh, in London, Ontario in 1973, 72 maybe, I, I'm not sure. And uh, I'd sat, it, I sat, the first verse, actually the first and last verse, describe exactly what had happened to me the night before. I'd sat down with a piece of paper and a guitar and the coffee, you know, a fresh pot of coffee and candles lit around the room and I burned some incense and... I did all that stuff, you know, it's supposed to put you in the mood, turn the lights down low, and I was being real creative and artistic, and oh, I was going to get it on. Six o'clock in the morning came along, you know, some eight hours later, and I was still sitting there, you know, <laughs> nothing would happened. All the candles had burned down, and I felt like a fool. Close enough.
I took up my pen tonight Couldn't seem to write It's like I got religion And then I lost the light An old woman once told me She'd always felt that way She said taken from the mold While it still can run A candle might not keep you from the cold But buy another candle, son It's not too much to pay For one more try And I had to smile Before I walked away Coffee houses bother me I cannot tell you why But it never seems a low Sounds as sweet as goodbye And the waitresses in passing Will remember all your names They say look around and try To meet a single eye Empty cups will mock me if I stay But buy another coffee stand It's not too much to pay And we will try to raise your smile Before you walk away Tonight in a room full of candles Now the cup of ashes drains away And at times it gets so hard to handle Knowing one more simple song has swiftly taken wing And I'm left alone to hear the song A lonely candle sing I found was nervous He cleared his throat a lot But framed in stained glass windows His eyes were lost in thought And I said Father, can you tell me Some happiness my right He said, rather seek your joy The blessings of your God Happiness from worship in his sight But buy another candle, son Before you start to pray And don't forget to cross your breast Before you walk away Tonight in a room full of candles Now the cup of madness drains away And at times it gets so hard to handle Knowing one more simple song has swiftly taken wing And I'm left alone to hear the song A lonely candle sing Cigarettes slowly burning down, and the final cup of coffee was cold and full of grounds. And maybe one last pipeful might send the words around, but underneath my hands, this night has slipped away and it leaves. As empty as this page One more candle flickers out The night is turning gray And 
And I just can't watch the dying flame I have to walk away Now tonight I have burned all my candles Leaving only ashes in their way And at times I get so hard to handle Cause simple songs leave me behind They all have taken wing And I'm left alone to hear the song A lonely candle sing. sure there's a lot of people out there saying yeah i know the feeling it's like it's it, what it is is it's creative coitus interruptus you know <laughs> it's terrible uh stan let's talk a little bit about um the other uh, another aspect of your writing that is the historical perspective the mm -hmm. the uh are the people in canada are they unaware of their history is it is it unbelievable unbelievably so it's uh, it. You've got to understand that for the longest time, Howard, our uh, history textbooks were printed in the United States, and in fact, for the most part, were even written there. And the American view of Canadian history, um, even American scholars' view of Canadian mm -hmm. history, is uh, pretty far removed from the actual truth, um, because it was far easier to make a big thing about American heroes, for example, uh, and because we're, we were, ex we're exposed to so much American television and radio and stuff, mm -hmm. we know, for example, an awful lot more about uh, Western outlaws like Billy the Kid than we do about the McLean brothers in B.C. who were equally as wild and shot up as many people and were as hard to catch and stuff. Um, in terms of our heroes, we had uh, um, sort of our version of, the, of Paul Revere, uh, a 19-year-old boy named Billy Green who made a 17-mile ride uh, through an untracked wilderness in darkness uh, to raise the uh, British troops um, in Burlington, in Burlington Heights, Ontario to repulse uh, a force of Americans who had crossed over the border and were busily trying to sack and burn Ontario during the War of 1812. Not only did he rouse the troops, but he led them back under cover of darkness through this untracked wilderness and got them into position for the attack, took part in the attack himself, scragged all the sentries around the camp just so that no warning would be given, and was primarily responsible for the capture and defeat of 2,200 Americans at the Battle of Stony Creek, including two generals and an entire artillery uh, outfit. And uh, I grew up uh, about 10 miles from the original Green homestead, and a few people locally knew the story. But as far as any textbook we had in school was concerned, uh, the United States had won every battle of the War of 1812, mm. and the Canadians uh, were basically a bunch of nincompoops. You know, we didn't know, for example, that uh, the White House, uh, your White House, your presidential mansion, mm. would not be white if it wasn't for uh, the Canadians in the War of 1812. Um, what happened was that a bunch of your people came up and sacked and burned what eventually became the city of Toronto as a reprisal. Um, a force of British regulars and a force of very irregular uh, colonial types, just sort of farmhands with guns, loaded onto ships, uh, went down to Washington, sacked and burned Washington, including setting fire to the presidential mansion, which at the time was painted pink. When they rebuilt it, they painted it white, and it's been the White House ever since. But can you imagine, you know, President Reagan spoke today from the pink house? <laughs> It'd be pink if it wasn't for us. Most Canadians have, um, really don't know much about their history. As they say, they know more about American history, or at least mm -hmm. they know more about Canadian history as it relates to the United States than they do uh, about their own local history or the development, the, pi the development in the pioneer days. I've made a study of it because I've always, always been fascinated by it, and I've always made kind of a great deal of what, what Canadian heroes we had, and there were plenty of them. Tell me about the song, Northwest Passage. Um, when I started designing the last album, I knew it was going to be a song primarily about Western and Northern Canada. And I conceived of Northwest Passage as, as a, a title for the album, which meant I would have to write a theme song. Um, I also wanted to do another a cappella chorus song, 
Uh, I'd done uh, one on each album to date mm -hmm. pretty well. Like, I guess Turnaround didn't have one, but uh, Fogarty's Cove and the live album all had nice sing-along chorus songs, and and I wanted one for this album. So I thought, well, I'll make sure I write it. Well, we went into rehearsal, and uh, it still hadn't been written, and then we went to the studio, and it still hadn't been written. So on the final day of recording, just before we started mixing, I sat up all the previous night and wrote Northwest Passage. Um, I was helpless with fatigue at that point, and uh, I, I remember at one point I was lying on the floor of the studio looking up. Everybody else had gone to bed. You know, I was completely alone in the place, and I was lying there, and I could hear, um, I could hear the sort of machinery cooling. You know, it, mm -hmm. that had been heat, heated up during the day. Some of the the electronics. I could hear the cabinet sort of cooling and clicking or something. It was just dead silence. And I started thinking of sort of the silence of the North and and what you know what John Franklin must have felt on that last fatal voyage of his, where he got so close to breaking out into the Beaufort Sea. He got within 40 miles of breaking through, and he would have been the first man through the Northwest Passage. But instead, he and all his men in both ships were lost. And it was kind of a terrible saga. And I got thinking again of, of some of the, f the first people who went across uh, uh, across Canada. There was an explorer called Kelso or Kelsey, um, depending on where you thought he was from, who first saw the Canadian prairies and he described it as a sea of flowers. And I, that always kind of stuck in my head. Um, David Thompson was the first person to accurately map and survey the Canadian Rockies. Uh, Alexander Mackenzie was one of the first people to reach the Pacific through the Canadian Rockies. Um, uh, Simon Fraser, another. Mm. Uh, uh, the Fraser River that runs into Vancouver was uh, named after him. All of these great explorers who were equally as intrepid as people like Lewis and Clark uh, or Kit Carson or any of them, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Canadians don't know about these people. I mean, we study them in grade six history or grade five history, and then that's the last we hear of them. Um, Canadians don't know much about how Canada was developed. Um, they they have a smattering of history from the time of Confederation, you know, the founding of our country in 1867. Um, you know, they know who Sir John A. Macdonald was. You know, he was the first prime minister and much, you know, the father of our country. But they don't know who the other fathers of Confederation were. Um, and I'm descended from one of them. Uh, so I, I take an interest in it. At any rate, through my songs, I've, over the past few years, I've been trying to not only satisfy my own lust for uh, uh, dramatizing these things, or perhaps mm -hmm. uh, you know, putting them in kind of a po injecting them into popular culture, but I've also had the very real motive of trying to make my countrymen a bit more aware of, of just how fascinating their history is, and um, not you know, sort of uh, help them to become a little bit more small n nationalist, you know. So uh, I wrote Northwest Passage with all of this in mind, lying on my back on the floor of the studio, three o'clock in the morning. The next morning, uh, you know, the producer got up and everybody else got up and we started, we had breakfast and then Paul said, uh, look, uh, if you got that song finished, we uh, got to record it today or else. I said, yeah, Paul, I, I, I've got it finished. He says, okay, let's hear it. So I sat there at the kitchen table and sang it. And when I finished, I, I was reading the words off the paper, of course. When I finished, I looked up and Paul was crying. You know, he, he said it was uh, a very stirring and, and very solid mm -hmm. piece. So then we went upstairs and recorded it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to hear a recording of it right now, but this is this is with this is this is a strange one. Uh, I don't have my band with me, and uh, it is a chorus song. So through the medium, wonderful modern uh, medium of uh, of studio electronics, um, what you're going to hear is a chorus of four voices, all of which are my own. I sing four part harmony here, and uh, I think it should be reasonably interesting. Uh, the 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 te studio technique is called overdubbing. Um, and I can, you know, I lay down one part at a time and I can hear what I've sung before in my headphones as I do. And I, so I sang the lead part and then I sang the high harmony, then I sang the baritone harmony, then I did the bass. And it sounds more or less like this. Ah, uh, for just one time, I would take the Northwest Passage to find the hand of Franklin reaching for the Beaufort Sea. Tracing one more line through a land so wide and savage and make a northwest passage to the sea. 
Westward from the Davis Strait, tis there twas said to lie, the sea route to the Orient for which so many died, seeking gold and glory, leaving weathered broken bones, and a long forgotten lonely cairn of stones. Ah, uh, for just one time I would take the Northwest Passage To find the hand of Franklin Reaching for the Beaufort Sea Tracing one warm line Through a land so wide and savage And make a Northwest Passage to See. Three centuries thereafter I take passage over land In the footsteps of brave Kelso Where his sea of flowers began Watching cities rise before me Then behind me sink again This tardiest explorer Driving hard across the plain Ah, for just one time I would take the Northwest Passage To find the hand of Franklin Reaching for the Beaufort Sea Tracing one warm line Through a land so wide and savage and make a northwest passage to the sea. And through the night, behind the wheel, the mileage clicking west, I think upon Mackenzie, David Thompson, and the rest, who cracked the mountain ramparts and did show a path for me. To race the roaring Fraser to the sea Ah, for just one time I would take the Northwest Passage To find the hand of Franklin Reaching for the Beaufort Sea Tracing one more line through a land so wide and savage And make a northwest passage to the sea How then am I so different from the first men through this way? Like them I left a settled life, I threw it all away to seek a northwest passage at the call of many men and find there but the road back home again. Ah, for just one time I would take the northwest passage to find the hand of Franklin reaching for the Beaufort Sea, tracing one warm line through a land so wide and savage, and make a northwest passage to the sea. You just heard Stan Rogers, Stan Rogers, Stan Rogers, and Stan, Stan Rogers, Rogers. <laughs> doing his song Northwest Passage. And if you want to hear the other version, it's on the record called Northwest Passage, which is uh, relatively new. Relatively, yeah. It's been uh, about six months now, six, seven months, and it's uh, doing very well. We took a single off it, uh -oh. um, a song called Night Guard, um, sort of your country western feces kicker, you know. <laughs> um, and it did fairly well for... Uh, uh, my first venture into the country single market I, in a couple of stations, a couple of major market country stations, I made it into the top 10. So great. Yeah. Not bad at all. More parts for my van. <laughs> <laughs> just, um, we really have time for one more and, but I just want to spend just a minute or two talking about 
the artist as the record company owner. Uh, it is a great privilege to be able to control everything that you do. In, it's a bloody art, necessity is what it is. <laughs> it's, uh, for a lot of people, um, they can't do it. It's just, I mean, the you work hard as a writer and as a performer. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of, you don't really run the record company, do you? Or you well, uh, in a very real sense, I don't do much of the day-to-day -day work. Right. Um, I'm the president and sole stock stockholder. Um, it is a limited corporation. Um, for the past few years, my uh, keeping it my, in the family, my mother has been running the day-to-day -day business mm -hmm. in the company. Um, she's going to be giving that up soon. Uh, she wants to retire from the record biz. And uh, so my wife and I will be taking it over. And I anticipate that I will have to spend considerably more time than I spend with it now. But we've got it set up in such a way that it's not really all that much of a struggle. We're still a pretty small potatoes outfit yet. There's only three artists on mm -hmm. the label and uh, um, seven items in the catalog. And uh, It doesn't take a great deal to supervise all of that. A few hours a day should look after it for now. In the meantime, um, the original purpose of the company, of course, which was to provide me a vehicle in which I could do the kind of albums I wanted to without mm -hmm. some uh, fool A&R director <laughs> breathing down my neck. Um, I mean, I've been through that. I, I was under contract to RCA Records in Canada and Vanguard Records in New York, and both of which were frustrating and unprofitable experiences that did not result in a, any recording worth a damn. So since I've done it on my own, um, I, I've got some records that I'm re justifiably reasonably proud of. Uh, they sell quite well for independent folk albums, and uh, the company supports itself. It, it was almost a necessity, and it's become, in many ways, kind of a pleasure. It's a lot of hard work. I don't mm -hmm. recommend anybody just diving into it without looking at it. But uh, but any if I can do it, almost anybody else can, because I'm not all that smart. I wouldn't say that. Listen, uh, I know there's Grit Laskin's also on your label. Mm -hmm. Who are the other artists? Uh, we've just signed the Friends of Fiddler's Green, which is uh, a group that Grit has been associated with over the years. And it is the most notorious, infamous, um, and funny, and longest, long, longest standing folk music organization in Canada. They, the Friends of Fiddler's Green run Fiddler's Green Coffee House in Toronto, which has been operating for donkey's years now. Mm -hmm. um, and they themselves uh, were the, sort of the first over the wall in Canada with the British traditional music revival. Mm -hmm. um, so they uh, they uh, do a com com tremendous variety of, of things. They play about uh, 15 or 16 different instruments between them, sing huge chorus songs, and um, they cut up a lot. Anyway, they've done an album, and we're very happy with it. It should be out maybe by the end of the year. And uh, if anybody wants to get a hold of uh, Fogarty's Cove product, uh, write to you at... Uh, at the station, and uh, I'm sure you've got our address. You've got Mom's sure. address. <laughs> I sure do. <laughs> we have time for one more song. I'm just trying to think what it might be. Um, should be something fairly, fairly short, I suppose, eh? No. Well, this one's kind of fun. This is off the new album. To love these lazy winter afternoons Starting out too late Giving up too soon Coming home to coffee and a trash heap Never paying any mind If things were never done on time Was when the fella could just let time slip away No worries, car or telephone Just rent and food to pay and every night with single buddies boozing at the bar Living for the minute, taking every hour in it But now there's just too much to do in any given day The car, the phone, the kitty shoes, too many bills to pay Running from the crack of dawn until the evening news And falling into bed too wiped to even kiss the wife good night. Whoa, 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 
just another working joke swing a matic singing rock and roll my sweetie's in the kitchen whipping up my favorite casserole i knocked off work at 10 o'clock the kids are still in school the coffee pot is perking to hell with bloody working whoa, whoa it sure is sweet to sit at home and let time slip away though tomorrow i'll be scratching through another working day but when I start to come apart from all the things to do, I know that I'll be taking soon another lazy winter afternoon. Whoa, 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 just another working joke. Just how lazy do you want to be here, anyway? Stan, once again, thank you so much. Oh, it's been a slice. Anytime. <laughs>